Welcome to the Cape Elizabeth School Board meeting, Tuesday, May 11th. Um, and if we would all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, We do have two adjustments to our agenda this evening. The first will come under unfinished business. We will add C, which will be consideration of uh, recommendations from the Communication Committee. And under new business, A should read a consideration of the principal's recommendation to uh, an athletic fee position. Now we can move on to the approval of the April school board meeting, uh, the school board minutes. Um, can we have a motion to accept them, Kevin? And a second? Second. Okay, all those in favor? Five, six, zero. They are approved, Mary. Um, we can now move to comments from our high school students. Rebecca is in uh, Bermuda right now, so she won't be attending. She did, however, give me her sunburn. Um, the school is winding down, and the halls are filled with the sounds of summer. The seniors are all in their uh, STPs to prevent them from spreading senioritis to the younger grades. Um, the, uh, surprisingly, all the seniors managed to get in their STPs, which are fun, rewarding, and legitimate. Uh, I know a colleague of me, mine, uh, Mark Barrett, is working with Governor Baldacci. He travels to Augusta every day, and that's one of the things he does. Uh, another, uh, another bunch of people are working at the Animal, Animal Refuge Center, and some people are shadowing uh, the ma uh, main radio station, WMPG, and I'm working outside at Fort Williams uh, restoring uh, two gun barracks. And uh, I'm sure you'll get some wonderful presentations soon to come by the STP. Uh, the prom, as you know, was last Friday, and we had a, a vintage Hollywood theme. It went very well, and no one got in too much trouble. Uh, the parents were at the red carpet, and they were pretending to be paparazzi for all the people, so I got some great photographs. And um, the seniors also have some more uh, uh, projects to do. Uh, as well as project graduation, the seniors have some fun events lined up, like a class trip to Canopy Water Park in New Hampshire, which is being paid out of the class fund mostly. Some of it you have to pay for. And a class barbecue at Fort Williams. As far as sports go, the girls and boys track team are doing very well, especially the throwing team. Uh, the girls and boys lacrosse team are doing well, but uh, boys lacrosse team lost a star player due to an ACL injury. But uh, hopefully they will they will continue and uh, a Mel Brooks musical is coming out in the spring and it looks really good and the uh, Cape Insight has its last issue I believe coming out this Friday so check that out and that is it any questions yes. I have a question um, the senior STPs are, is there going to be a public presentation evening for the public I uh, believe they're uh, presenting yeah uh, aren't, uh, aren't they presenting to the school board? I know we haven't invited in the past, um, and I didn't know if there was uh, just the school board or whether it's also for interested public um, to hear some of those projects. It's, yeah, I believe. It's usually for the public. It's usually a public. It's it. usually in this room. I don't. Yeah, know. yeah. yeah I've, it's Senate? broadcasted. Yeah. I can't remember. We'll be, so. I was yes. going to say it's that yeah. first week of June usually. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, middle school. Um, all the sixth graders are up at Chewanke, hopefully enjoying a beautiful week. The fifth graders will be going to Fort Williams at the end of the month for a field trip. 
in June, thanks to a grant from the Middle School Parents Association, each fifth grade homeroom will have the opportunity to experience a two-hour sail aboard the refurbished schooner called the Bagheera. Students will learn about the ship and the historic sites they will see on Casco Bay when Captain Twain Broaden meets with the students at school before their trip. The fifth and sixth graders just had their spring band and chorus concert on Wednesday. The fifth grade band is one of the biggest with about 120 people. The seventh and eighth grade jazz band, concert band, and chorus will be performing tomorrow at the high school gym and Thursday in front of the whole school, with the exception of the jazz bands. The Hawaiian theme dance on April 30th went very well, just like the social on May 7th. Thanks to the Parents Association, there will be one last dance in social. Third trimester progress reports came out last Wednesday. On April 30th, the Civil Rights and Student Council attended a second leadership meeting. This was the follow-up to the one they attended in January. They discussed what steps they had taken to make our school a better place. On June 5th and 6th, the Student Council would be participating in Relay for Life. Okay, thank you, Nora. Any questions or comments for Nora? No. Thank you. Communications. Um, we are all invited to participate in the Memorial Day Parade, um, which is on Monday, May 31st. And um, actually, I urge all the school board members to do that. It's a fun thing um, to walk through town. Um, and we are to be on the corner of Fowler Road and Route 77 at 8.15 in the morning. Also, um, Rebecca Millette and Trish Brigham were just elected as the two uh, newest school board members who will be sworn in on June 14th, replacing uh, myself and Jennifer. And now we can move to comments from the public. Um, do we have any? I didn't have anyone officially contact me, but I think there are. I know there's one person I would like to make a comment. Okay. Gail. Yeah. Gail. Um, good evening. I um, I notice I'm limited to five minutes. Um, and I, I kind of timed my thing here, and it's going to take more like 10, but I feel that the public, um, who hopefully is watching at home, should hear some of these comments. Um, I'm speaking about Latin. Uh, since September of 2000, I've been working on having Latin offered at the high school. I would like to remind the board that at the time I obtained signatures from 296 parents representing 638 students that indicated that they wanted Latin offered at the high school. This academic subject is offered at all of the other surrounding high schools. The program has been offered at the high school for two years, but not without the threat of being canceled each year, which leads to confusion among parents and students when selecting courses. The first year the Latin was offered, there were two sections of Latin one. The second year that Latin was offered, because of budget crunches, families were told that only Latin II was being offered and that Latin I would be offered the following year. By alternating years, students would always have the availability of two years of Latin, freshman, sophomore year, or sophomore, junior. Certainly not the best situation, but at least an effort to offer the program. Many incoming freshmen did not find out about the availability of Latin I being offered this past year until the last minute. It is no wonder that the numbers were down and only one section of Latin I was offered this year and one section of Latin II. The upcoming school year and the third year Latin was to be offered, there were rumors at the eighth grade open house that Latin was not going to be offered again, causing confusion among parents and students as to what courses to sign up for. The current numbers for Latin I sign up for 2004-05 school year are nine freshmen, 16 sophomores, nine juniors, and two seniors. Note the low numbers for freshmen, probably caused by confusion, and the high numbers of sophomores, the high numbers of sophomores, 16, probably caused by confusion prior to their freshman year. 
Only five students, four sophomores and one junior, signed up for Latin II for next year. But there was only one Latin I class to draw from for a Latin II class. Hopefully this would have been just an anomaly created by the past year's question over Latin availability. It is fairly common that two sections of Latin I will translate to one section of Latin II. Out of this year's class of 18, only five signed up for Latin II, but one student is moving and would have signed up, and, and five said they could not fit Latin II into their schedule, but would have taken it if they could. I know it is difficult to offer a class for just five students, but I would like to remind everyone that when I presented my original research on Latin in other comparable schools, Freeport High School was offering a Latin IV class for just seven students, and Yarmouth High School had a Latin II class for just four students. Falmouth, Yarmouth, and Freeport all said that the numbers vary from year to year. Their programs are not on again, off again, just because of numbers. They have made a commitment to their students. Also, word gets around that Latin II is more difficult, but isn't that the kind of challenge and opportunity that we want to offer our students? Hopefully, you have all seen the article in the April 23, 2004 issue of The Century, titled, Cape Students Acclaim, Acclaimed for Latin. More than 80% of our Latin students, quote, received national acclaim as a result of their high scores in the national, annual national Latin exam, close quote. I feel that the entire Latin program is being judged and eliminated based on these numbers, which I believe were created by the inconsistent and untimely information relayed by the administration and the school board. I also take issue with receiving a letter from the high school informing me that the Latin program has been eliminated when the final budgets have not even been voted on. Because of the low numbers, the program was easy to eliminate, and ergo, that's Latin for therefore, easy for the high school and the school board to find a quick, large cost savings. But how does eliminating an academic program like Latin, which is offered at all of the other local high schools, fit in with the academic excellence that the administration and the school board are always touting as the goal for the Cape schools and students? I also feel that non-academic courses are driving the selection of academic courses. Health and physical education are automatically inserted into freshman and sophomore course schedules, leaving little room for electives. A student could just as easily take physical education senior year and not have it impact his educational opportunities. Latin needs to be taken early on in high school to help with English and SAT preparation. Freshman and sophomore years are the appropriate years to take Latin, but Latin is being squeezed out by health and phys ed. Freeport High School does not automatically plug these two courses into students' schedules, but just make it known that they are requirements that must be fulfilled prior to graduation at some point over the four years. Falmouth High School does plug in one semester of PE freshman year, but leaves the other PE semester open. Previously, Falmouth's health requirement was completed during junior and senior years. Yarmouth High School does not automatically plug phys ed and health into the schedules, but typically phys ed is usually done freshman year and health in the 12th grade. Let's take a look at how we schedule courses before dropping a worthwhile academic subject. I also take issue with the requirement that in order to participate in jazz band, a student must be enrolled in a band class during the day. As far as I know, this is the only extracurricular club or activity that has a four credit course requirement. My daughter could not participate in jazz band first semester because she only had one elective and she chose Latin. In order for her to participate in jazz band second semester, she had to receive permission from the high school principal to overload her course schedule as a freshman. She has no study halls during the day, which makes it difficult for her to meet with some of her teachers. And I only allowed her to overload because three of her courses were non-academic courses, health, phys ed, and concert band. Next year, she was going to have to defer phys ed to her junior year in order to include Latin II in her schedule and band so that she could continue to participate in jazz band. It is no wonder that under the Cape Elizabeth High School band section in the course schedule, 
it says that because quote of the growth in the cape elizabeth high school instrumental program close quote is it really growth or is it just a mandatory requirement for participation in an after school activity let students sign up for band classes because they really want to and not have to Yarmouth High School has an after-school jazz band program, but does not require a credit course during the day. Falmouth High School has an arrangement similar to CAPES, but if a student does participate in the school jazz band for the entire year, they receive a quarter credit. I'm not speaking out in hopes of saving Latin by eliminating other programs or someone's job, even though a great teacher has lost his job with the elimination of the Latin program and is currently job seeking as far as Boston as I speak, but in requesting that the high school and the school board take a closer look at scheduling and course availability that affects parents and students. A different schedule might translate into higher student participation in Latin, an academic subject that is in our students' best interest and should be offered by our high school just like it is in all of the other local high schools with which our children are competing. The administration and the school board must stand firmly behind the Latin program and not cut it or threaten to cut it every time there is a budget issue. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Um, and now we can move on to um, recognition um, for work uh, with one of our parent volunteers in peer mediation at um, Pine Cove. As you know, every so often, uh, the school board takes time to recognize um, individuals, whether it be teachers, community members, parents that um, really help us in the school and, and do the kinds of things that we're really thankful for and put the time and effort into to either programs or initiatives that help us um, um, in, our, in our schools with, with special initiatives. And this evening, we're re recognizing an individual that's spent either nine or ten years, I think, in uh, the peer mediation program and um, has been involved with that program, I think, since its inception um, with uh, Sarah Berman. Sarah Berman was the originator of that. So we have two items here. Uh, one is a certificate and another is a plaque uh, from the Cape Elizabeth School Board. And I'd like to read what's on this. The Cape Elizabeth School Board presents this award for service and dedication to Richard Romeo in recognition of your longtime volunteer service to the children of Pond Cove School. It is due in large part to your unwavering efforts and continual support that many of our students are trained in peer mediation. For the Cape Elizabeth School Board, Thomas Fursella, Superintendent and Marie Prager, School Board Chairperson. I'd like to have you sign that. Oops. So I'm going to give her a pen. And we also have a plaque that this plaque is presented to Dick Romeo in honor of, it says in the plaque, 10 years of dedication and service to Pond Cove Elementary School Peer Mediation Program. Thank you. I know you have a very full agenda, and I just wanted to say a few things. Uh, first of all, thank you for the kind words and the thoughts. It's been a real pleasure for the last 10 years working with Tom at the uh, Pond Cove School, uh, putting this program together. It's also been an absolute privilege for me to work with the children. As you know, Cape Elizabeth was probably one of the first communities to introduced peer mediation at the elementary school level. Um, what we teach them are the basic elements of a mediation process which is used in our court system. And I can tell you, having worked in the court system as a trial attorney for 25 years, it has all of the same basic elements. And for that reason, many people felt in other communities that children in the, in the uh, third and fourth grade just wouldn't understand it. 
I can tell you that they do. Not only do they understand the process, but they are very quick to put it in their bag of tricks and to use it. Um, and it's not unusual for us to receive comments from parents a couple years later telling us that it has made a very significant difference in the lives of some of these children. Having said that, I need to say that it would be totally inappropriate for me to accept this recognition um, to suggest that I uh, am solely responsible for this program. Um, Sarah and I did put it together, but this is one of those unique programs where it really requires a whole community to make it work. And there are some very separate parts here that you may or may not be aware of. Um, the Phoenix Foundation is a private foundation that has supported this program from its inception and has picked up all of the expenses, out-of-pocket expenses that weren't covered. And I'd say over the past 10 years, the foundation has spent more than $3,000 on this program. Another re very important element of this program are the trainers. We train the children in teams of four. Um, there are two team mediators and two disputants. And we try to have a trainer with each four children. And these trainers, believe it or not, are attorneys and mediators in our community. These are professionals. Um, and they are essential to this program. And some of these trainers come back year after year, even though they don't have any children in the program, and in fact, some of them don't even have any children in the school system. They do it because they really believe in the mediation process and what it can do for people, adults, and children. The other thing that's important to know is that we have the children for a month, um, four week uh, evenings, or for, four evenings during the week for four weeks. And um, when, we're, when we finish our training, we're gone. What makes this program really work are people like Karen and, and Pat who take up where we leave off and work with these children for, the, for another year. Uh, that's what makes this program real. And finally, I would say that this program could not have happened without Sarah Berman. It was because she had a vision and she had the courage to try to put something like this together. She believed in the children, she believed in mediation, and she did everything in her power to put the two together and to create the program. And this recognition is really hers. Um, and, and it belongs to her because uh, she and I worked together, but it was her concept and her dedication for many years that made this work. And so I want to say thank you again um, for the recognition for everyone who's worked on the program, but also for the opportunity to put various segments of our community together, which is a very caring community, to put together a program that really works for kids and that for some of them has made a very significant difference. So I want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and, and to all the people who have helped make that work at Pine Cove. Um, and now we can move on to the superintendent's report. Tom? There are a few items um, that I would, um, for the most part, just give you some information and background on and, and an update. Uh, regarding our future direction plan, um, there was a team of administrators that met, uh, took a look at the information that was created from our August workshop. And there has been um, some suggestion as to an update. Um, and the school board will be, will be receiving a packet of, of information. But just so you know, the, the major changes, and in, in, in probably um, you wouldn't be surprised that there is one, one new strategic goal that will be added to the future direction plan. And that is to assure that all, all learners, underline all, meet high academic expectations with the objectives of expanding the tools and strategies staff members utilize within their classrooms to meet the needs of all learners. And secondly, to develop program initiatives to support students who are struggling to meet academic standards. And that's something I know that was a, a school board budget goal this year and an overall school, school board goal, and now we see it reflected 
in our future direction plan it was also something that came up very high in the list and probably was the number one issue that came out of our our august workshop some of the other goals have been reworked and reworded and there are some new objectives that that have been added but the rest of the goals remain unfortunately we did not retire anything because we haven't completed everything and that's as it should be it's a work in progress and we'll continue to work on that and our hope is that this information that was generated from this committee then will be turned over to a future direct direction planning group under the direction of the superintendent to put together those action plans also I know you're all aware but for those of you especially in the public and that are watching at home are not aware regarding the laptop initiative the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation has awarded a twenty seven thousand dollars in support of the laptop program that twenty seven thousand dollars did not take the place of the usual mini grants that they give out nor did they need to tap into their endowment fund this was money that they've realized through the fundraising and the other initiatives that they have undertaken so it is in addition to the the grants that they are in the process of giving out now and also they were able to award this without tapping into their endowment which there will be under getting underway in the fall a capital campaign to increase that even more that will pay for approximately half of the first year of our lease you also have in your packet a notification of a teacher resignation David Greeley at the high school and a notification of a teacher retirement Jill Bell who you all know and speaking of technology has done a lot of work at the middle school in video conferencing but I'd also like to inform you that the learning we've just received notice that the learning results graduation requirement has been postponed by one year and lastly many of you are aware that the town council has put together a group of approximately 65 individuals representing all segments of the community to discuss the impact of the Pulaski initiative if that were to pass I was asked to come to their meeting and speak at least in terms of conversations that we might have had as an administrative team in looking at if Pulaski were to pass and there were the 1% tax cap what that would do to the schools so what I had information that I shared with the group that included our current budget that looked at the programs that by law we are mandated to offer what does exactly does the learning results legislation say that we have to do in our schools just to let the committee know that there are many things you know we don't have options on you know we have negotiated contracts that we have to honor we have certain programs and coursework that we have to offer at our schools so I did offer at least from my perspective the impact Pulaski would have on our schools and that would be from the information we received from the town manager's office a three million dollar decrease in our in our in our present budget so basically what I offered to that group was we would have a bare bones program that that was strictly an academic courses with guidance being eliminated to maybe one travel guidance counselor between all schools it would mean the decrease in all elective areas because by law we are required to offer programs in the performing arts the amount of time is not mandated but we would need to offer something so that may dwindle down to one art teacher who travels among all the schools to get to three million dollars in a budget of 15 is a significant decrease athletics co-curricular activities would all be eliminated entirely you know it would just be a huge impact on the schools you read a lot about this initiative in the in the in the newspapers and 
carol polesky talking about there's there's plenty in this in the budgets of the towns and schools but in a small town like cape elizabeth there isn't anything extra and what we have for a carry over is minimal and it just offsets the next year's the next year's budget and that revenue that we carry forward and 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 it's a very small amount uh it's important i think that people understand the impact um if you put this kind of a a cap on towns um what it would do in in the way the this initiative is bring is brought forward would have a a much bigger impact than um proposition uh 2.5 did in Massachusetts which i was i came into Massachusetts right after 2.5 and, and it just decimated the schools um there were schools that just operated on a half day schedule uh in Massachusetts after 2.5 and, and it took them years um to get over that and they're still um reeling from the the effect of proposition 2.5 and, and in Massachusetts there was an opportunity for local communities to override um in the local communities could vote to put more money into the into their school budgets in this Pulaski referendum there is not that opportunity so if it passes in Maine um you're going to see a different kind of a school system um we will be able to just offer if we're fortunate at the very basics um i tried in at least my presentation to this committee not to impact the academic program but that's just my 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 best guess um to try to keep class sizes at a as a, at a at a at a level that we've been somewhat used to um but this this i could be wrong on numbers and it could be even worse um so it is a very serious issue when you decrease that amount of money um from the school budget um so i urge you to get informed um to really be active on this and to encourage people to vote against and this will won't be until november but i think this would be a real detriment to the schools not only in cape elizabeth but throughout the state is that right um and there is a um forum this sunday mm -hmm. um and i think it is at the library the thomas memorial library actually at the cafeteria at, at the cafeteria and what time does that start do you know 1 to 3 1 to 3 for anyone who wants more information there there is a a panel of um six or eight people from the town discussing this whole um Carol Polesky will be there. Yes. Um and there is a moderator. The matter I think is Yeah, there'll be a moderator. Um I guess uh, Phil Harriman who uh comes from Yarmouth along with some representatives from MMA I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and our town council chair. Yes. Um uh, represent from the town council and from the school board. But it's just extremely important for people to be informed. Um you know it it's it's like the old saying you you know you read what you want to in, in the newspaper and and you can take anyone's slant on it. Um but it, I it, it's just important for people to become informed about this initiative and 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 what it means. Okay. Thank you. Excuse me, Mary. If I might piggyback on that, I should have done this during communications. at the local election in June which includes school board candidates and some state officials i believe and perhaps some national level officials you will have an opportunity to vote on what is now question 1 which used to be question 1a which provides or requires the state ultimately to pay 55% of all education costs as well as 100% to special education and i would urge the listening public as well as everyone here to look into that and urge them to support and vote in favor of that thank you okay thank you kevin now we move on to the principals reports nancy you're up first i just you know because i'm a middle school person i have to comment on this this is really interesting that tonight we're facing the clock is that don in honor of Pete Dawson and myself cuz I can call oh, Pete later and podium yes oh, yeah. <laughs> okay I just like to know what the rules are um <laughs> well good evening uh first for any um parents who may be up on the um podium or out in the audience or perhaps listening I'll give my chwanky update because our 6th graders and 13 14 members of our staff are at chwanky this week and we have heard from Gary Record he calls in each day um yesterday's report was that they all arrived safely 
Um, they got off the buses, things were great. They only forgot one piece of paper, which we faxed to them, so they were off and ready to begin their adventure. Today's report was that um, by the time Gary called us about midday, the weather was great at Chewankee. Everyone had gotten settled and all the tents set up prior to the rains arriving last night, and they were enjoying some of the warmest weather that we've had at Chewankee and looking forward to today's adventures and activities. And everybody was out and about and involved. So um, they're doing well, and having last night's rain will make sure that they go down into Chewankee lore as having the real experience, because you have to have at least a little bit of bad weather um, so that you don't get the story that you didn't have the real experience because you never got wet. But um, they are having a grand time, and tomorrow Scott Labby and John Casey will be going up um, to visit with them and bring us back some good word from all of their adventures. Just as I was, as the day was ending, Conrad Berthune, one of our world language team members, Conrad teaches French and Spanish, he had been the person who um, coordinated the national French exam for our students this year. We had a number of eighth grade students who took that exam, so just hot from his hands. Um, the results um, in the state contest, and we compete in a level with other middle schools and students who have taken um, the same amount of world language that we have, or similar experiences. Just to report to you that one of our students, Libby Cummings, um, placed first in the state um, for all of the students. Ashley Robinson placed fifth. Alicia Sioka placed sixth. Bethany O'Meara placed seventh. Abigail Dancos placed eighth. Morgan Alden, ninth. Aaron Hatton, ninth, and Tommy Haugie, ninth. They all shared that position. Further, on a national basis, where they go with schools all across the country, Libby Cummings placed second, Ashley Robinson placed eighth, and Alicia Sokoka, Sioka, pardon me, placed ninth. So they did very well um, and did a great job. So another compliment to our world language team and all of the effort and the work they do, and of course, grand compliments to all of our students who participated. As you were reading the retirements and things, you noticed that um, Jill Bell will be departing. And I just wanted to um, say a couple of things about Jill because one of the things that as it became apparent that we would need to reassign, I would need to reassign one of our fifth grade positions to the seventh and eighth grade, we went through a process it came down that that position would be the job share position of Allison Hawks and Jill Bell, offered that to both of them. A job share which this board has supported and which has been very successful for us at the middle school, met the needs, both personal and professional needs, of both Jill and Allison throughout the last several years. And they have worked with it very, very well. They have gone on to personal journeys and adventures as well as professional development activities and still maintained a very consistent program for their fifth grade learners. One of the things about organizations though is that same type of job share was not possible to replicate in grades seven and eight. So I could offer them both positions but they became more that traditional part-time kind of position. And early on in our discussions, it became apparent that that was not a good match with Jill. But Jill, who said for years she always thought those retirement dinners were great and she loved going to them, said that she realized as it got closer for her own, she didn't want to do it. So she wanted to make sure she didn't submit her letter until after the Education Association retirement dinner um, kind of thing. Uh, not because she didn't respect those, she just realized she didn't want to be the focus of attention. However, Jill Bell does represent something in our profession that I think we need to note, and that is a teacher who goes out there and finds something that's an intriguing and interesting idea that will make a difference in how we learn. And Jill did that with her exploration of video conferencing. And the board supported her for a year sabbatical, and she went out and she worked. She made all these connections with Verizon, with um, the New York Institute of Technology. With She was one of the only teachers, the only teacher from New England that was there, that was invited. They have continued to invite her there. She worked on journal articles with people. She found out what she would need to bring video conferencing to Cape Elizabeth. And she has devoted the last three years of her tenure with us to doing that in her classroom from the beginning days when sometimes the connections weren't great 
But being a risk taker, Jill moved forward, and we never gave up on video conferencing. Um, former Governor Angus King heard about this. He wanted to come down and see it, and Jill said, sure, come ahead, never knowing if all the connections would work that well, because that first year, some of our, our connections were a little fuzzy. Take you right back to the early days of television. Um, however, we have moved to a place now where we have the video conference in a place that not only do fifth graders in Jill Bell and Allison Hawk's class use video conferencing, but fifth graders in all of the classes do. Evan Solander's class has been down there. Sally Connolly's class has been down there. They've all connected with that, working with their team partners. So almost every fifth grader has had an experience. She's worked with Claire Ramsbotham in grade six. She has worked with Paul Casey in grade seven. In fact, they've been doing a video conferencing with Senator Collins. Um, and it's become part of what we do. So as Jill goes on to the next adventures in her life, she certainly has left something at Cape Elizabeth Middle School that's new, that's unique. We still have great things to discover with it, to discover with it, and it will grow. But I thank her for having that original idea, believing in it, and taking a risk to make it come true the sign of a real professional educator, and we are indeed going to miss her. So I um, wanted to be sure I could say that to her, because she probably would walk out if I was saying it and, and leave, but, you know, that's too bad. <laughs> She's not here tonight, so I can say that. Um, the other thing that we have, just to bring you up to date, real quick on a housekeeping thing for us, as you know, in our work calendar, we do have that building flex day, and as I reported, Quite a while ago, the middle school has chosen to use that day as June 16th, and we do have a committee that's working on that, and we are looking forward to having a very productive, constructive day um, for our staff on that day, and we really hope that what comes out of that is a way that we do things differently for our staff and how we share ideas, but also will have an impact on the difference in the way that we interact with the students in our building as well. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. You know, I was surprised also to see Jill Bell's um, retirement in our packet, and I know that we're going to miss her tremendously at the middle school. Um, Pine Cove, Tom. Good evening. I'd, I'd like to start by adding my congratulations to Dick Romeo and Sarah Berman, who started that program either nine or ten years ago and to the Pond Cove guidance counselors and third and fourth grade teachers and parents for keeping it going. Dick also mentioned that the Phoenix Foundation helped fund it. The other source of support has been the uh, Title IV-A or No Child Left Behind funds. Uh, it's a recognized effective program, uh, even at the elementary school level. and We've gotten great results, so I appreciate all the work they've done. Tonight was uh, kindergarten orientation night in the high school, and I'm pleased to say I think that was the last time we'll have the kindergarten orientation uh, meeting in the high school. It's been a great run at the high school. I appreciate everything the high school has done, the administration and the staff and the kids, but it will be a real pleasure next year at this time to have our orientation in the Pond Cove Middle School cafetorium and then walk down to the new classrooms. Uh, as Nancy did, I want to bring you up in a few events at Pond Cove. Uh, they seem to be, most of them, indicative of the level of support and involvement of the parent community at Pond Cove. Um, for example, last week the PCPA hosted its annual teacher appreciation luncheon. And it's hard for me to believe that they can meet the high standards they set each year from choosing a theme, from having placements and presence and doing all the waiting on, uh, on the teachers, but they, they did it again. And needless to say, the food was terrific. Everybody in the staff was invited and had a terrific, relaxing time. Also tomorrow, and it's the first time since I've been here, thanks to the efforts of um, arts and, en and enrichment co-chair Susan Spagnola and Heidi McInerney. McInerney, they've worked with the Allied Arts team since about October to uh, structure an arts day, a full day arts day at Pond Cove. These parents have managed to recruit 28 local artists to come to Pond Cove tomorrow. We're going to throw out our regular schedule, call it zero day, and every class will have the opportunity to work with three separate artists during the day. Then in the afternoon, a performance artist is going to come, um, meet the whole school, one through four, and do um, a mural-sized portrait of a recognizable hero in about 20 minutes. I've seen the video, it's very exciting. Should, we should have a great time tomorrow. 
on a, on a different level, the PCPA had its um, monthly meeting last week. And Kelly and I went over and we, there was a lot of interest in increasing and making even deeper the communication and partnership between Pond Cove and the parent community. And we realized, uh, and I think the parents reminded Kelly and me, the vehicle we had that's been on vacation for a while was the climate committee. I think it was, sometimes you don't miss things till they're gone. It's not exactly gone. It just fell in between my um, caretaking abilities and Kelly's. So after talking to the PCPA people who were there, there's a lot of interest in reviving that and even deepening its um, connection between us and the parents to talk about curriculum, to talk about um, the way we conduct um, parent conferences and to bring up some tough issues in a very pleasant, uh, I think, supportive environment. So we'll be, you'll be hearing, about, I used to report about it, but we haven't done it lately. So we'll get that reinstalled. On the curriculum front, since we are in mid-May, I may have told you in the beginning of the year that for the first time um, since I've been here again, probably the first time since we started Everyday Math, all the teachers met to agree on a basic schedule for covering all the important units in everyday math. Uh, because this time, we, previously this time of the year, we'd be rushing to get through. From what I hear from team leaders, this has been a comforting thing to do. By having a pacing guide with some flexibility, we're getting through the EM, the everyday math curriculum, with a little less stress. Uh, it's very important that we get at least touch on everything because in addition to being a spiral, it's a recursive spiral. You really can't leave things out. So it's been an interesting um, professional development activity and uh, it's, it's worked so well, we will probably use that device. You've heard me and Kelly talk about the phonics material. We did the same thing with that and now I think our next project will be to have the comforting pacing guide for the course of studying and writing. So i um, pleased to report that. Questions? No questions. Thank you, okay. Tom. Thanks. Jeff, the high school. <clears throat> the um, mention of David Greeley, who is retiring this year, has prompted me to think about a couple of a couple of people who are actually leaving, uh, and. Either one, of, one of them, Ray Cooper, had retired earlier, and I didn't comment on, on Ray's departure at that time. And I want to just very briefly, Ray, for those of you who know him, has been a social studies at, a teacher at the high school for, um, I think, about 16 or 17 years. Um, and more than any other individual, Ray Cooper's touch is on the social studies curriculum at the high school. Um, in terms of his emphasis and belief in the importance of true world history, uh, not Western-centered world history, but true world history, which is the hallmark of our freshman and sophomore year curriculum. Um, his is also, his touch is also on the Holocaust program, which has been a wonderful uh, and well-received program by uh, students of all ages uh, that really translates, examines and, and looks at a, a very difficult and grim time in history and tries to draw out some of the ethical um, implications of the Holocaust, and then seeks to have students extend those beliefs that they're learning about um, in very practical applications, the most recent of which is the substantial support uh, for the Siddhartha School uh, that has gotten a lot of, uh, and appropriately so, gotten a lot of publicity recently in local newspapers. I also wanted to mention Heather Sanborn, whose name has not come up <coughs> as a retirement, uh, and that's because she's been on maternity leave this year, and Heather's departure is really simply by virtue of the fact that she did not tell us that she was returning uh, by a certain time. I've talked to Heather, she's, and, and um, but Heather, um, I sort of regret it, and I sort of feel a little guilty about this, because when I was evaluating, observing Heather over the last couple of years, one of the things I would almost always say to her uh, was that she would make an unbelievably good lawyer, the way her mind works. Um, and I think it's a thought that Heather had had in her mind for some time. Uh, for those of you who, who know her, she does have an incisive analytical mind. She's a very, very, very bright lady. She is going on to law school. Um, so <clears throat> it's, an, it's an exciting th time for her, but uh, we will miss her. And lastly, I wanted to mention David Greeley, whose name is on the list today before the board. Um, David has been a very strong math teacher for the last five years, I believe. We borrowed him from Chevers High School after he'd had a distinguished career at Chevers High School. And, and for all his, his abilities as a math teacher, um, he leaves a touch in that regard. 
Uh, but one of the things that, that the board may not be aware of is that more than any other person at the high school, David Greeley's was influential in bringing to Keepers with High School the Senior Transition Project. Uh, it's a project that has had a counterpart at Chevers High School for a number of years, and though we hesitate to acknowledge our reliance on Chevers High School for anything <laughs> at any time, uh, we did borrow David, and he brought with him a very good idea from Chevers High School, and I think it's been a real uh, benefit for our senior students uh, for the last several years. The prom, I wanted to publicly mention um, and thank and congratulate our uh, present junior class advisors, Jake Jackson and Joanne Moriarty, uh, who are the, I've seen many very, very, very fine class, uh, class advisors here and elsewhere, and certainly every year we've had them. Uh, Joanne and Jake really distinguished themselves and have continually distinguished themselves in their work advising the junior class. And the um, prom set up at the Holiday Inn by the Bay the other day was absolutely fantastic. And it wouldn't have happened without them and with the help of parents that they had coordinated. Uh, it was a successful prom, um, um, which to me means there was nothing in the newspaper afterwards. <laughs> it was a fun prom. Um, and I think it was, it was a good event, and I think the kids really appreciated it and enjoyed it. Um, but I did want to mention particularly Joanne Moriarty and Jake Jackson. And I also wanted to thank parents. I did send a letter home to parents about the prom uh, before the prom took place. And from all accounts that I have heard, parents were very uh, positive, constructive, um, and supportive of the concerns that uh, that letter raised. And the last thing I wanted to mention is laptops. We did have a meeting last week or the week before, I can't remember which, uh, with um, Nancy Hutton and, and Bev Bisbee came and, and Tom Frisella and Paulina Portria and Ernie McVeigh um, and Gary Lenoy and Ginger Raspiller and myself and Mark Tinkham. Uh, so there are a lot of fingers that are sort of in the pie who have to be involved in sort of communicating uh, what do we need to do uh, to prepare the way for the coming of the laptops. And I think with that meeting we took a big step in that direction and relieved a lot of anxieties and did some coordinating that, uh, that will prove uh, very beneficial uh, when the laptops get here. That's all I have. Jeff, I have a question. Yes. In terms of the laptops, are we proceeding right now with Apple computer ourselves, or are we holding for an answer from the state? Um, I believe, Tom may know better, I believe we are proceeding with Apple computer um, ourselves. Well, that would be, I mean, we're, we're still waiting for the, to hear from the state. Um, because obviously if the state's going to offer the, to, um, to fund it, um, it's the same, same program. Um, we would proceed with that, um, that Apple's offering, but we, we aren't entering into any kind of an agreement until we know what the state's going to do and until we, until we have our budget lines finalized also. Um, and I, from what I understand, as you know, we have the, the collaborative effort with Yarmouth and from what I'm hearing, the item is still part of the Yarmouth budget, so that would continue and we get that same discount because we're working with Yarmouth. Do we have any indication of when the state will make a final decision? Yeah, we, it was a month ago, it was two weeks ago, it was a week ago, and now it's I don't know. We, we do have a realty meeting on Friday, and they may update us at that time, but other than that... The update that we get is that there's a new plan as you probably read in the newspaper, um, with Apple, um, that the, the commissioner and the governor, I guess, are working with uh, and trying to get some sort of a, a rental agreement for the first year, which basically would mean, a, to me, the way I understand it, a, a four-year lease over five years. So the first year you don't pay, you get the equipment, but you're going to pay for the equipment, but it just takes a little bit longer. But there's no word, official word yet. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments or questions for Jeff? Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. We can move on to um, committee reports. First on our list is the Finance Subcommittee. Elaine? Yes, uh, the, the Finance Committee met prior to this evening's meeting. Um, we had a, a quick update from Paulina Portria regarding the state subsidy. Uh, as the final numbers had come in as anticipated. Um, 
We also had some very good news, um, which was uh, we did hear back from the State Revolving Renovation Fund, uh, the application that we had submitted to the Department of Education for the Pond Cove project, building project, um, that we would be receiving a $200,000 grant from them, um, in addition to an $800,000 interest-free loan, um, which figures out to about $175,000 saving in interest on that project. Um, and that would be reflected in, uh, after the bids come in, but um, on the project, but it would be reflected in a decreased bonding amount um, uh, for that project. Uh, we also have another application into this revolving fund for the high school that we will be hearing on. Um, that was a more extensive application, but uh, I'm hoping that uh, this is an early sign of maybe uh, subsequent success for the high school application also. Um, we reviewed the appropriation reports and signed warrants. Um, we also had a school board budget workshop prior to the Finance Committee uh, as we were taking a further look at um, some options in how to reach the town council uh, approved budget that they for the, that they, they approved last night for the school board um, it became clear uh, we did have some public comment there but it did become clear that we were going to need some more time to work through some of these options there are several issues out there um, regarding athletic fees uh, regarding uh, academic programming um, along with um, I think the only thing we kind of reached a consensus on was the idea about uh, leasing a bus versus purchasing a bus uh, to have some savings during uh, next year's budget uh, cycle. So we will schedule, or we have scheduled, a, an additional meeting for uh, next Wednesday evening, which would be uh, the 19th of May at 7 o'clock, uh, hopefully in the uh, Jordan conference room uh, to finalize some of the line items in that budget um, based on some recommendations from district leadership teams, school board members, etc. And that would be it. Okay. Um, thank you, Elaine. Uh, the policy subcommittee, uh, Ann? The policy committee met on May 4th and we had just one agenda item that day. That was to discuss how to proceed with um, the entire policy manual review, revision, um, and any updating that we needed to do based on the recommendations that, rece that we received from our legal counsel that I presented at last month's school board meeting. Um, after some discussion, what we decided to do is to form a working subcommittee that will meet throughout the summer. And the charge of that committee will be um, as follows. Be to review all of the notes provided by legal counsel on each policy and to develop a work plan for the 0405 uh, school year. So that um, subcommittee at this point is comprised of the three principals, Jeff, Tom, Eismeyer, and Nancy, and myself as chair, currently chair of this year's policy committee. And um, we have two meetings set up. One will be on um, June 1st at 12.30, from 12.30 to 2, and the next on June 10th from 8 to 12. So we really do hope it's a, it's a lot of work. Um, the book is huge. There's a lot of minor revisions that need to be done, and there are some probably more um, thoughtful um, discussions that need to take place around that. But our real hope is to come out of the summer with a real working plan for next year's school board. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. In the communication committee? Um, the district leadership team was presented with the recommendations that our committee has been working on throughout this year. And we'll be presenting those under old business for a vote later on this evening. Um, but I would like to just say a couple things about the committee. Um, I, I wanted to first thank, this is the first year that we've had a communication committee, and for those out there listening who may not realize, the purpose of the committee was to support 
a goal that the school board set forth this year, which was to enhance and improve communication to and from the school board. And I think that we all recognize that communication is, is important in all of the work that we do, but it becomes really tough to quantify how we can really enhance and improve it. And I think that, that the committee has come up with some, some good recommendations that um, are really pretty easy to, to follow through on for next year's school year. Um, I was happy to hear Tom Meismeyer say earlier tonight that there's some discussion at Pond Cove about um, just really improving communication at the Pond Cove school between parents and teachers and administration there. And that might be some, there might be some ideas there that could carry forward into next year's committee. I'm not sure what will happen with this committee next year. I, I, I would like to see it continue in some form because um, I just think it's important to really keep that out there as something that we always strive toward and to really improve. Thank you, Anne. Um, and the superintendent search committee. Um, since our last school board meeting, we are in the process of um, interviews with semifinalists, and we completed three interviews last week. Uh, we will have two additional interviews this coming Saturday. At the end of Saturday, we hope um, that the school board uh, will decide on um, the finalists that we would want to pursue. Uh, and that's it for right now in the superintendent search. Um, so we're just in the midst of interviewing. Um, we'll move on to unfinished business. Uh, consideration of the school calendar that we received in our packet. Mm -hmm. Are you speaking to that? Um, this was presented last month. There have not been any changes. I didn't receive any calls from anyone. Um, so it's, it's the same as you received it um, last month. And so the first pupil day will be uh, Wednesday, September 1st. Yes. And that's what most people are always interested in. Um, so I think we need to have a motion to accept um, this school calendar for 2004-2005. Elaine? Um, I move that we accept the proposed calendar for the 2004-05 school year as presented. Okay, and a second? Second. Comments or questions? Jennifer? Yeah. Um, given the fact that we're still finalizing our budget, um, if uh, this has late start days only K-8, if we extended those, does that affect the budget, um, the calendar as no. such? No. So well, we'd, we'd have to change. I mean, piece of, it won't change the number of days. It won't change where the days are. So we can still approve it no. even if we were to extend Add it K-12. Okay. What you're <coughs> looking at are the days that school will be in session, the number of days, whether it's a half day or a full day or a late start. Isn't, isn't what you're approving. It's the number of days, where the days are located, where the vacations are, and when you start and when you finish. Okay. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Six, zero. Okay. Next on our list is consideration of the revised um, 04 05 school budget. And um, tonight, we will be um, voting for the total dollars of the school budget, not necessarily um, what cuts we have to make, um, which totaled $267,000. Um, as Elaine had mentioned earlier, we will be meeting uh, next Wednesday to make those final deci decisions. Um, so we need a uh, motion to accept the total budget dollars. Elaine? Uh, yes, I move that um, the school board approve uh, the 2004-05 school budget uh, dollar amount of $16,555,861. Okay. And a second? Kevin? 
Any comments or questions? Jennifer. Um, I have sort of a statement about this budget. Um, my job as a school board member is to advocate for the schools and the children of this town who attend them. Students K-12 and their parents comprise almost 50% of the population of this town. Voters of this town showed their support for the schools with their overwhelming support of the referenda last fall. Unfortunately, the town council has given the school board not only an arbitrary budget cap, but an unrealistic one at that. The, this budget cap has, after all contractual and fixed cost increases, such as negotiated salaries, utility costs, as well as the new bond, which was approved by the voters of this town, has left us with a whopping $15,000 to use to try to move these schools forward. With this budget, our schools will not only not move forward, but are in real jeopardy of moving backward. Given the fact that the town council has the right to arbitrarily set a limit on the school budget, I will vote to approve it. I will only vote to approve this totally inadequate amount because without school board approval, our schools cannot continue their business of educating our students. Thank you, Jennifer. Anyone else? You betcha. Okay. All those in favor? Six, zero. Now we can move on to consideration of recommendations from the Communication Committee. Um, I sent these out to all of you today via email, but I'll read them for, to remind you what they are and for the sake of the listening public. So these are the recommendations that the committee has come up with and that the district leadership team has reviewed, given input to, and has in some cases revised and that they are in support of. There are seven of them, so it's not really very lengthy. No, there's no card, you just emailed them. Number one, have school board representation at two to three parent association meetings each year to give updates and answer questions. Item two, place school board on the high school and middle school weekly email list. Item three, encourage staff communication to school board of special activities and items of interest going on in classrooms. Item four, extend an open invitation to teachers to give a presentation at a school board meeting to share a classroom project, endeavor, or aspect of their curriculum. Item five, develop a series of informational flyers on a range of issues pertinent to communication. Item six, post subcommittee minutes onto school website. And item seven, post subcommittee meeting agendas onto school website. So that's it. I guess I need a motion to accept these seven recommendations for next year's um, school year. Or it, it, do we want to discuss it first? Are there comments or questions? Oh, you move. Okay, motion. I move that we adopt the recommendations of the communications committee. Second. Jen. <laughs> so is there any discussion or questions, comments? I have a, a, just a quick logistical, um, like if we accept these recommendations, then what happens with them? You need to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I realize that, but I mean, how, how is that then the responsibility of the board, of the communications committee? I mean, how does, I'm just curious how. Well, I think it'll be the board to figure out who then will it be, will we then have, it's not, a, the communication's not a standing committee, so I think it would be up to the board to then determine if we want the communication committee to determine to carry these out, or do they need to be carried out by some other body? Great. <laughs> <laughs> Is that it? Any other questions? All in favor? Oh, great. Thank you. I just wanted to say the district leadership team did discuss the recommendation. I think that, that what you have will really, really, a lot of it happens informally, but this really puts down in a plan uh, the kinds of things that we always talk about doing, but either we never get to or don't do a very good job at. So I, I think it will really help. It's a, to move in the right direction. 
Thanks. And also, I would just like to thank, if I could just take one more moment, and thank the um, staff people who served on this committee this year, Shari Robinson, Kelly Hassan, Julie Salikas, Kathy Walsh, and Dwight Ely. Thanks very much for your support and time in this committee over the year. Thank you, Anne. Now we can move on to new business. Um, the first thing on our list is consideration of the principal's recommendation to an athletic fee position. Um, last spring, the um, school board reinstated the basketball coach for another year, 2003-2004. Um, um, with that, we had asked for the principal um, to um, work up an evaluation for this season. Um, Jeff Shedd has done that. He has met with, he met with the school board last week in executive session and um, we are, the school board um, is ready to make a recommendation for the basketball coach um, for another season, 2004-2005. Um, all of the um, requirements that the school board had put forth um, had been met in that recommendation. And um, we need a motion to accept the recommendation. Uh, Kevin? I move that we accept the principal's recommendation to extend a one-year contract to Jim Ray as varsity basketball coach. Okay. Madam Chair, I wish to recuse myself from this issue. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Um, and a second? Jennifer? Um, are there any comments or questions? None? All those in favor? Five and one recusal. Okay. Uh, we can move on to consideration of a request for the high school speech and debate team um, regarding an out-of-state field trip. Remember, at our workshop, um, this request came to you just so that we could get it on for, for action uh, this month for the speech and debate team for an out-of-state trip to national level competitions. And I think that was explained at the last meeting. And it'll come. It's coming back this evening for action. Okay. Um, can we have a motion, Elaine? Uh, I move that we uh, approve the request from the Cape Elizabeth High School speech and debate team regarding uh, their uh, requested state out-of-state field trip. I'm sorry. That's with an S. <laughs> <laughs> because there were two of them, if I remember. <laughs> okay, and a second? Jennifer. Comments or questions? Is there any uh, cost associated with this, or is this just an approval for them to not be attending school or to be going on the trip? There's a cost, but uh, it's not borne by the, by the, there is, what has been, but there is a small amount that's been budgeted. There is a cost, but it's, it's within the budget. Okay. So there's no separate money that Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. All those in favor? Six zero. Um, and we have um, several negotiated um, contract agreements. The first is with um, the school board and the Cape Elizabeth um, Food Services Association. Um, do we have a motion, Jennifer? I move we approve the negotiated agreement between the Cape Elizabeth School Board and the Cape Elizabeth Education Association for pizza. Okay, and a second. Um, Elaine, comments or questions? None. All those in favor? Six zero. Okay, and the second is the um, negotiated agreement between the school board and the um, bus drivers and custodians. 
Do we have a motion to accept this contract? Jennifer? Uh, I move we approve the negotiated agreement between the Cape Elizabeth School Board and the Cape Elizabeth Education Association bus drivers and custodians. Okay. And a second? Second. Ann? Um, any questions or comments? None? All those in favor? 6 0. Um, and the last is a no negotiated agreement between the school board and the Cape Elizabeth um, Educational Administrators Association. Uh, do we have a motion to accept this negotiated contract? Jennifer? Uh, I move we approve the negotiated agreement between the Cape Elizabeth School Board and the Cape Elizabeth Educational Administrators Association. Okay, and a second. Kathy? Um, questions, comments? None? All those in favor? Six, zero. Um, and the next on our list is consideration of a recommendation to the building committee to consider employing an owner's rep for the high school renovation project. Um, we, uh, we, we have been discussing um, the possibility of hiring an owner's rep for the um, high school project. In terms of, in light of considering that we will be hiring a new superintendent, which um, the main role of a new superintendent would be to uh, make all of the decisions for the high school project and the elementary school project. Um, we are looking to hire an owner's rep to work in conjunction with um, our construction manager to relieve some of that responsibility um, from a brand new superintendent who we feel should be focusing on um, the schools and, and curriculum and what's happening every day in our schools. And this was something that we wanted to discuss with the school board. If the school board feels that this is a reasonable request, we would like to have a recommendation from the school board to the building committee. And I think Elaine um, can elaborate a little more on what an owner's rep is, or you may want Pauline to come up and talk about it? Um, sure. Um, an an own, owner's rep would be uh, an individual or a firm represented by an individual that would um, oversee in the owner's best interest, which would be the, the school and the town, to make sure that the all of our best interests were being addressed at the high school. Um, they would be um, taking a look at the various change orders, invoices, uh, they would be making some site decisions, um, they would be a liaison between the superintendent and the construction manager. Um, it could be written up so that we would determine what the extent of their decision making uh, capabilities would be, um, but we would probably end up uh, if the building committee agreed to this recommendation, um, we would be advertising for the position, interviewing for the position, and then uh, the school board would be making the final decision because it would be a contract between the school department and the construction, I mean the um, owner's representative. Um, the general feeling is, is that it is an 18-month project. It is a very um, complex project with um, you know, an owner-occupied building. Um, there's going to be a lot of on-the-spot decisions, um, but the general feeling is that the, a new superintendent um, will be spending a lot of time getting up to speed in our school department, and while they'll be involved, this would uh, be in our best interest and possibly save us um, some money. It's hard to, to measure that, but um, there is the potential there based on some of the discussions that we've had with the Bureau of General Service and some other community members that uh, it would uh, help pay for itself. Um, so I, I am asking that um, if there's any questions regarding it, um, um, that this, the money to pay for the owner's rep, I am hoping would, well, I, it, 
I think would probably need, yes. it needs to come from the school bond. It's nothing that would come out of our operating budget, um, but it would be out of the already voter approved school bond monies. Um, does anyone have any questions as to? Yeah, uh, I've got two. Um, if we approve this, it's not a Approving using one, it's approving the building committee investigating it. Correct? It's recommending that the building committee would pursue that. The, 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 the building committee, you're recommending to the building committee that they consider um, an owner's rep, and then that recommendation um, would come from the building committee on who it is. There would be a subcommittee mm -hmm. of the building committee, similar to when the construction manager was hired, that would interview, advertise, and interview, and the recommendation because it, it is your representative would come back to the school board much as the superintendent recommends a candidate for position the building committee would recommend a candidate to be the owner's rep and you would have to vote on it and approve it okay so we're not what we're voting on then is whether to use one or not right and whether you think it's a good a idea to use person. one and the specifics would come out of the building committee okay um and quick question what's a rough guesstimate for one of these. Oh, Pauline, do you have any? No, I, I know we've talked. It's, it's, it's an hourly rate usually. Um, sometimes there are firms that will bid, um, which can be large firms that they have an individual that would serve as the owner's rep. Sometimes there are individuals who do this kind of work on their own. Um, I know in the South Portland project, because of the complexities there, a lot of renovation, different schools, they have employed an owner's rep. They're not necessarily on the job every day. Um, if they're in most projects, and in this one, there probably will be a weekly meeting of the architect, uh, the construction manager, maybe some of the trades that are on the job, and the owner's rep would be there, represent, along with the superintendent, business manager, whoever else needs to be there. But the owner's rep has that expertise, has worked on jobs like this before, and would be there to help with the decision making. As, as Elaine said, when those change orders come through, to check them to make sure that they're accurate, and all that other requisitions and all those other kinds of things, use of funds. So there's another set of eyes representing the owner on the project. Is there anything else, Pauline, that you found out that hasn't been mentioned? No, it's usually a per hour fee, and not to exceed a certain dollar amount, and by the job description, by the, the uh, criteria. So we'd ask for an estimate from the people who uh, apply, and they can range anywhere from what I'm told for a project this side, 50000 to $100,000 for the length of time of the project. So that's a year and a half. Right. Okay. Kevin? No question or comment that regardless of who's the superintendent at the time construction begins, I would strongly urge that we do utilize an owner's rep. They bring a degree of expertise in the construction industry that I would not expect any of us to have. Okay. Anything else? Any other comments? Questions? Okay. Um, can we have a motion to make this recommendation? Kevin? I move that the school board recommends to the building, building committee that they seek to retain a uh, owner's representative for the school projects. And a second? Second. Okay, Anne. Um, any further comments or questions? Elaine? I just want to say on that motion, um, you, you mentioned it on the school projects. This would be only for the high school renovation project, um, that the Pond Cove project is a, a uh, contractor bid and there's no need for an owner's rep on that. So I just wanted to be clear. It would be for the high school only. Let me be more specific okay. then, that we do this for the high school renovation project. Thank you. Okay. And so, Anne, you seconded it. Any yeah. other questions? I have a question. Um, should we have some kind of language in there that uh, indicates that this, the owner's rep, um, if we're making a recommendation to the building committee, that this person or persons that are employed are um, um, suitable to the building committee? I mean, I know maybe that's assumed, but 
The building committee will do the interviewing and, the, and make the recommendation of a that person. the school board? Yes. Okay. All right. And I have a question. Can the building committee decide not to accept this recommendation from the school board? They might come, they might have the discussion and come back to the school board and say, we don't think it's a good idea and these are the reasons why. Okay. So this is a recommendation yeah. to the building committee. Okay. Um, any other questions? No? Okay. All those in favor? Six, zero. Thank you. Okay. Next on our list is the consideration of the superintendent's nominations to teaching positions for 0405. Now, with the, the teaching positions, and, and I just want to be clear that the positions that are before you this evening are positions that are taking the place of existing positions, um, none of which are on the for lack of a better term, $266,000 list. So that they're like the, the retirements, the Ray Cooper retirement, the David Greeley retirement, and those positions, existing positions. Mm -hmm. um, so your, your approval, I don't, I don't see any way how that's going to impact um, those particular cuts. Is everyone comfortable with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Do we have a motion? Well, the first, let me just go through them, we'll do them one by one. Um, the first one is a social studies position at the high school, and the nomination is for Mark Ash. We do these individually? Indivi well, individually? Yeah, I would rather for teaching position. Okay. okay. Kevin? I move that we accept the superintendent's nomination of Mark Ash for a teaching position at the high school. And a second? Uh, Jennifer, comments or questions? None. All those in favor? Six, zero. Next is a math position at the high school, and the candidate uh, nominated is Evan Thayer. Motion. Elaine? I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendation uh, for the hiring of Evan Thayer uh, for a high school math position. Second. Um, Kevin, comments, questions? All those in favor? Six, zero. Um, the next is a grade one position, and the nomination is Sarah Frost. A motion for Sarah Frost. Kevin? I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendation of Sarah Frost for a teaching position at Pond Cove. Um, a second? Uh, Kathy, comments, questions? None. All those in favor? Six, zero. And the last one is a grade two position at Pond Cove School. The nomination is Lynn Spadinger. I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendation for uh, Lynn Spadinger as a teacher in Pond Cove. Okay. And a second? Um, Elaine? Comments, questions? All those in favor? Six, zero. Before we go down to the next item, um, I want you to notice we're getting better at the, um, the forms. Um, we are following the new hiring procedures, um, which the form should look the same. We're getting closer, um, but uh, you know, we're encouraging the, the administrators to use the form and, and use the, the hiring procedures, which we spent quite a bit of time going through, so that, so that you get at least on all the candidates some basic information um, um, regarding to all of our positions. And these were very easy to read this time. This is very good. Okay. Uh, next on our list is the superintendent's nomination of teachers for continuing contract status. Teachers for continuing contract um, did come to the school board, um, as did the, um, the, the second year probationary contracts. Um, there have been some adjustments um, due to some discussions at the school level um, in looking, and we do take a hard look um, at teachers who are going to go on to continuing contract or um, second year probationary contracts. So you'll notice that if you have your list from last month, there, there are 
um, some changes to the list, but that's only because we've uh, made some decisions about um, moving some people on to the next level. Um, but these people are the ones, and the administrators feel very comfortable with this group of people moving on to continuing contract status. Um, and I'll go through them by school. Um, Karen Dow, Pond Cove, grade one. Eric Nielsen, Pond Cove, grade three. Linda Sigmund, Pond Cove, grade one. At the middle school, Megan Crabtree, grade five. Anne-Marie Dion, world language. Cheryl Joy, special education. Sarah Kinsella, physical education. Evan Solander, grade five. Sally Tamaro, computer, one class. At the high school, Allison Coulter, Spanish. Courtney Farrell, science and math. Thomas Lazat, instrumental music. And Dawn Pons, science. We have a motion. I move that we accept the superintendent's nomination of teachers for continuing contract status for the 2004-05 school year as presented. Okay, in a second. Elaine. Comments or questions? Question. Tom, if I understand what you said at your introduction to this, there are fewer people on this list than there yes. were on the original list. Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other comments, questions? Okay, all those in favor? 6 0. And the list for teachers who are eligible for second year probationary contracts at Pond Cove School, Julie Nickerson, grade one. Uh, Jackie Petrillo, Special Education, Deborah Sampson, Kindergarten, point five. At the middle school, Rebecca Bean, General and Choral Music, Kathy Walsh, Grade 5. At the high school, Carrie Aponovich, Social Studies, Elaine Brassard, Special Education, Karen Dyer, Ceramics, point two. Rachel Guthrie, Computer Teacher, point six. Erica Kent, English, Karen Lamb, English, Mary Poker Page, Social Studies, point four. Kristen Thomas, Choral Music, point six. And Jonathan Whitehead, Physics and Math. System wide, Kristen Preve, Occupational Therapist, and Maureen Messer, Occupational Therapist. Okay. Is there a motion to accept these? Kevin? I move that we accept the superintendent's nominations for second year probationary contracts. In a second, <clears throat> Jennifer, comments, questions? None, all those in favor? Six, zero. Okay, before we adjourn this um, meeting with a request to enter executive session, I'd just like to go over um, dates for future meetings. Um, our school board workshop will be Monday, May 24th, seven o'clock in the high school library. Policy Subcommittee, Tuesday, June 1st, 12.30, here in the Jordan Conference Room. Um, Finance Subcommittee, June 8th, 6.30, in the Jordan Conference Room, followed by our regularly scheduled school board meeting. And uh, Wednesday, May 19th, 7 o'clock, in the Jordan Conference Room, um, to finalize the budget. We also have a, a building committee meeting uh, this Thursday, May, um, uh, May 13th at 7 o'clock in the Jordan Conference Room at West University. Okay, thank you. Why is the workshop on a Monday? Um, Just to see if you're paying attention. Okay, we're I, I, I knew when you whipped out your calendar, Nancy, you were going you to ask that question. I'm not available on that on the, okay. on the Tuesday. <laughs> but thank you for asking. <laughs> Okay, and now um, we uh, need a motion to um, close public session and we will enter executive session to discuss the superintendent evaluation and the superintendent search. So moved. Okay, and second, second. Elaine, all those in favor? Six, zero. Thank you.